Welcome to London Dairy Christian Church, where we are here to love one more. We're so glad that you have chosen to join us, uh, whether that's live or if you're viewing this a little bit later. Either way, uh, we're just glad that you are here with us. If this is your first time checking out London Dairy Christian Church online, or if you would like more information on how you can connect with us, fill out our connect card that is online here and it's pinned down in the comments below. Now for each new person who fills out the connect card, we want to say a special thank you. And by doing so, we are going to donate $5 to Teen Challenge, which is our mission of the month. There are a few things happening here at each week and we want to make sure you are invited to those. The first is our Monday prayer and that's happening at eight o'clock Eastern Standard Time here on the Facebook page. And then on Friday evenings, join us at eight o'clock PM Eastern Standard Time for a devotional thought from Pastor Dave. In a few moments, we will sing some songs together and the words are gonna be on the bottom of your screen. So we invite you to sing along wherever you are. And then we will do a study of God's word together. And then later in our service, we are going to remember what Jesus has done for us through the act of communion. So at this point, if you haven't done so already, go ahead and get a bread, whether that's a piece of bread, a cracker, a tortilla chip, and some type of juice or liquid, whether that's orange juice or grape juice, water, milk, um, have those ready for us to use a little bit later in the service as we take communion together. Today we're continuing our service called Servant Leader. Each week we're going to look how we can live out the posture of a servant leader and that can be in our community or in our household. And this week we're looking to discover how servant leaders live in willing surrender. So please say the verse of the day with me. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Philippians chapter two, verses three and four. If you'll please pray with me. Father God, may your spirit be at work in us today as we gather together around your son and around your word. God, help us to discover how we can live in a posture of a servant leader as we love and serve our community to the best of our abilities. Father, lead us in your truth as we gather around the person of your son. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Hey, church. Every year we like to take a moment on this weekend to pause and remember those who've given their lives in service to our country. We recognize that the freedoms that we hold dear are available to us because men and women have willingly surrendered their lives to protect us. So we want to say thank you. Thank you to the families who have paid the ultimate price, who've lost loved ones in service to our country. Thank you to the men and women who have served and are serving to protect our freedoms. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for those who've given their lives. We pray that they would be remembered and honored and respected this weekend. May they know how much we appreciate their family's sacrifice for our country. Thank you to the men and women who have served and are serving, who protect our freedoms on a regular basis. Thank you for all they give for us. Thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. Let's sing together. Worthy of all grace, rejoice, sing the 
Jesus carried up the hill. He has walked this path before us. He is walking with us still. Turning tragedy to triumph. Turning agony to praise. There is blessing in the battle. So take heart and stand amazed. We're going to sing nothing but the blood together. Blood can wash away my sin. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Blood can make me whole again. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow oh no other found i know nothing but the blood of jesus Through my part in this i see nothing but the blood
Hey, good morning. Uh, as we're diving into God's Word today, uh, we're going to start again with our kids' moment. Have you, do you have a treasured possession? Uh, something to you that, that's super important. I remember when I was a kid, I don't know why this was, but when I was a kid, um, my mom and dad took me to, I think, Walmart, and I got a black and white Franklin batting glove. And for some reason, that was my treasured possession for a while. Like, I wanted to wear it to bed at night. Uh, it was during the summer, we would get thunderstorms and potentially tornadoes, and so I would want to go to sleep wearing my batting glove in case the tornado came, so I would have it to take with me. Uh, now, this is my, one of my most treasured possessions. Uh, this was a ring that was my grandfather's and my grandpa's. Um, we called him Grandpa Meatball. It was my dad's dad. And this is one of the things I have that came uh, from my Grandpa Meatball that I uh, treasure because it was something that he valued, and so I value it as well. If I were to ask you, uh, kids, what's your most treasured possession? Maybe you could have your mom or dad share in the comments of our video what you really value. Maybe it's a stuffed animal that means a lot to you. Uh, maybe it's another toy that you love. Maybe it's a blanket or a pillow. Uh, whatever it is, please share with us uh, what that might be. There's a story in the Bible where Jesus goes to have dinner at someone's house. And while there, a woman comes and she gives Jesus her most treasured possession. It was a jar of perfume that she would wear around her neck. It was in what they call an alabaster jar. And this perfume was worth an entire year's wages. I mean, that's a lot of money. And she broke the jar and poured the perfume on Jesus' head and on his feet. And the Bible says that he did that to prepare, or she did that to prepare him for his burial. And the disciples, that they see this amazing act of love and devotion to Jesus, and they say, what a waste! This could have been given to help the poor. And Jesus says, no, no, you guys don't understand that what she has done will be remembered throughout generations because she did this act of love and devotion to me. Jesus knew that in a few days he was going to give up his life to die for us, to give us the gift of salvation. And he said that what Mary did was to give the very best thing she had to offer to him. Jesus offers us the most wonderful gift imaginable, life with him that will never end, the gift of everlasting life. It is free, but a very costly gift. It cost Jesus his life. What can we give to show Jesus our love for him? I don't think he wants a diamond ring or a stuffed animal or a toy or a Franklin batting glove. I think he wants us to give him our very best, which is our life. To give our life to Jesus, to follow him and to serve him. Thanks for joining me today, kids. Uh, thanks for sharing what your most treasured possession is. As we continue to dive into God's word, I have a question to start with today. What would you do if you were an elite athlete known around your country and you were also the child of a millionaire looking to inherit vast amounts of wealth? What would you do with your life if those things were true? How would you live? That was the life of C.T. Studd. C.T. was a well-known cricket player in England. His father uh, was a wealthy, wealthy man. And C.T. was the one who was poised to inherit his father's wealth. 
like many young men who find themselves in that kind of life situation, famous, athletic, and rich. C.T. lived it up. He pursued his sport and the pleasures of life. But then something happened. In 1878, a visiting preacher asked him if he was a Christian. Stud knelt and thanked God for salvation and peace and joy flooded his soul. Unfortunately, he didn't share his faith with others. And because of that, his faith became spiritually cold. For six years, he lived a life which he described as backslidden. The love of the world had crept back in. In 1883, Stud went to hear the famous evangelist Dwight L. Moody speak. And again, his soul was stirred afresh, and immediately he began to tell others about Jesus. He would later say that he had tasted all the pleasures of the world, but none gave him so much pleasure as sharing and bringing his first soul to trust in Jesus. Two years later, C.T. sailed for China to join Hudson Taylor as a missionary. He dressed like the Chinese, ate like the Chinese, and learned the Chinese language as well. While in China, he turned 25. Under his father's will, that was when he would inherit a large sum of money. And before ever receiving any of that money, he already began giving it away. He gave all that he could away, and then there, there was about um, 3,400 pounds, he was British, pounds instead of dollars, uh, left. And he gave that to his future wife, who then gave that away as well. So by the time all that money was able to be his, it was gone. He gave it all away, instead choosing to trust the Lord to provide what was needed. And they found that God faithfully supplied them. Oh, when funds would run low, they would say, funds are low again, hallelujah. That means God trusts us and he's willing to leave his reputation in our hands. The studs served in China and India and toured all over for the student volunteer movement. When his wife became sick, Stud sailed to Africa to open mission work in Sudan. His wife, Priscilla, was able to join him for a year before she died. And C.T. eventually died as well, serving in Africa. When those who asked him why he was so overboard in his zeal, he said, how could I spend the best years of my life in living for the honors of this world when thousands of souls are perishing every day? He also said, some wish to live within the sound of church or chapel bell. I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. When C.T. Studd encountered Jesus and began to live for Christ, he willingly surrendered his athletic career, his fortune, and his future for Jesus. No one forced him to give these things up. Instead, he did it willingly. In doing this, C.T. Studd modeled humility. Humility is a necessary posture and attitude for servant leaders. The Bible defines humility in Romans 12 as not thinking of yourself more highly than you ought, but to consider yourself with sober judgment. And this means that humility doesn't think of, itself, of ourselves too highly or too lowly but that instead we know exactly who we are. We rejoice in our strengths and we recognize our weaknesses. This definition of biblical humility is further explored in the book of Philippians. Look at Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 1, it says, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God some to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. 
being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Paul tells the Philippians and us to value others above ourselves. Not to seek our own interests, but the interests of others. He goes on to tell us that we do this because our example for this is Jesus, who did not consider equality with God something to be held onto or grasped or used to his advantage, but he took the nature of a servant and adding to his divinity, humanity. He added to his divine nature, our broken, frail human nature. And it says he became obedient to death, death on a cross. Because of Jesus' humility, God raised him and exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name so that every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. Paul says that humility is having the proper attitude about ourselves that then leads us into how we act toward others. He says we should not be so concerned with our own interests, but with the interest of others. In Core 52, Mark Moore summarizes it this way. He says, humility is not so much about how you feel about yourself. It has much more to do with how you treat others. I'll say it again. It says, humility is not so much about how you feel about yourself. It has much more to do with how you treat others. That humility is how we are to live and treat others. Here's what the scripture says. That servant leaders live out their posture of humility through willing surrender. Servant leaders live in willing surrender. That, see, servant leaders follow the example of Jesus. Jesus willingly surrendered by lowering himself and adding to his divine nature, human nature. He came down to live among us on earth. He took the frailties and weakness of human nature. He felt hunger and thirst. He knew hot and cold. He felt weak and strong. He was tempted, tried, and tested. And yet all of this he did willingly. He took it willingly for us. There was nothing and no one that forced him to do these things. But instead he lived it out through humility. Willingly surrendering for our benefit. He did it willingly because of his great love for us. And so as servant leaders... We follow the example of Jesus and seek to live in willing surrender. This is not forced or coerced surrender. No one's making us do it or tricking us to do this. But it's a posture we adopt willingly. We choose to give up certain things so that we can live as, certain, live as servant leaders who love their communities. That we do this because God's heart is for our community, and we want to follow and live in that heart. There's a story from the life of Jesus where we are able to witness what willing surrender looks like. If you have your Bibles, or you have your Bible app on your phone, go ahead and turn to uh, the Gospels. We're looking for the Gospel of John. It's the fourth book of what we call the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. We're looking for big number 12, so that's chapter 12, uh, small number 1, verse 1. John chapter 12, starting in verse 1. It says, Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served, while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took a, about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. 
and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Hold your spot there in the Gospel of John and flip back a few pages to the Gospel of Matthew. We're looking like a, we're going to look at the parallel passage, so the same story but told in Matthew a little differently. So Matthew chapter 26, big number 26, small number one, uh, small number six, verse six. Matthew 26, starting in verse six, it says, "While Jesus was in Bethany, in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him." with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. So, so what we can gather from these two stories is that Jesus is invited to a dinner party in the town of Bethany, where his friends Mary, Martha, and Lazarus live. The party, it says, is at the home of Simon the leper. And while there, John tells us that Mary, the sister of Lazarus, brings an expensive bottle of perfume, and she begins to anoint Jesus with it. Matthew says that she pours it on his head, and John says she pours it on his feet, and so probably what they're trying to tell us is that she started at his head and worked down all the way to his feet, and poured it on his head, and then poured it on his feet. Matthew says that this, jar was in a, that this perfume was in an alabaster jar. Now, most likely this is a bottle, that hung from a necklace around her neck. It was most likely one of her most prized and uh, precious possessions. It was worth an entire year's wages. I mean, I mean, think about that. It's all of your work for a year, however much you earn in a year, that's how much this costs. And now for most of us, we don't have very many things that are that expensive. Maybe a car, uh, mostly definitely our houses, and most of our houses are more than one year's wages. But most of us don't have something that, it, that would take all of our money from a year to buy. But that's what this was for her. It was probably meant to be a part of her dowry. That whenever she was going to get married, that would be one of the gifts given to the family of her husband-to-be. And yet for some reason, she still has it which seems to indicate that she didn't get married or had uh, no longer any prospects uh, to get married. So this is her uh, treasured possession. This jar contained pure nard or myrrh. Now this was something she values incredibly highly, both for its physical value, but also I I'm going to guess for all the emotional value of what this would mean to her to give up these hopes and dreams of one day being married. But she brings all of that and she pours this incredibly valuable possession on Jesus, onto his head and onto his feet. See, she willingly surrendered what was most valuable to her by giving it to Jesus. See, humility surrenders what we value. That Mary gave her most prized possession to show her love and devotion to Jesus. What do you value? Is what you value drawing you closer to Jesus or is it keeping you away from Jesus? Mary willingly surrendered her precious jar of perfume for Jesus. Often we think about what we value. We tend to think about possessions, or money, or people. We think of what we value as our cars, or our houses, or our bank accounts, or the pleasure we can get from the fun we can have, vacations, or the people we love. But today I want to think about value and maybe something a little different. Many of us value comfort. That we don't want to do things that are hard or difficult, so we hold tightly to comfort. And our comfort keeps us from surrendering what we value to Jesus. Many of us value control, that we want to be the one in control. Or at least we have contingency plans where if things go awry, we have a plan on how we can make the most of it or how we can handle things. And there's some wisdom in that, but sometimes that behavior is just control, recognizing it doesn't have complete control. And there's nothing like a global pandemic to help strip from us the illusion of control. Many of us want to hold tightly 
to control, that we want to be in control of all the situations we find ourselves in. And yet our control keeps us from surrendering to Jesus. That these two things that are highly valued in our culture, comfort and control, can hinder us from surrendering to Jesus. Because Jesus, uh, when he calls us, doesn't let us stay comfortable. Instead, he often puts us in positions where we are uncomfortable. And he doesn't allow us to be in control because he's the one in charge. He's the one in control. And it's his will, not ours. And so to follow Christ, we must surrender what we value. Surrender your comfort and control so you can share God's love with someone this week. How has comfort and control kept you from being used by God to love one more? Maybe this week you can surrender your comfort by telling someone you'll pray for them. Or telling them why you go to church. Or telling them why you believe in God. That can push us out of our area of comfort. Maybe you can surrender your control by praying for others. By sharing with someone your fears and how you try to control things so you don't have to face your fear. Or maybe you need to apologize to someone. Someone who your desire for control, that desire and ways of trying to control things, has hurt them. And you need to apologize and say, I'm sorry that my desire to control things has hurt you and seek their forgiveness. See, humility surrenders what we value so then we can act in love. The next thing we see is that humility surrenders what people think. Look at John chapter 12, verse 3. It says, Then Mary took a pint of nard, of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. In Nathaniel Hawthorne's classic work, The Scarlet Letter, Hester Prynne is forced to wear the scarlet A on her chest to show that she's done something scandalous, something forbidden and shameful. In Jesus' day, something equivalent to wearing a scarlet A was letting your hair down in the company of men. That was scandalous. No, women were not supposed to do that. It was only for the private of your own home with your husband. And yet, in the story here, Mary does that. She lets her hair down and she begins to wipe the feet of Jesus. Now don't forget this is taking place in the first century. First century Israel. In Jesus' day, they didn't wear Nikes. They didn't have Under Armour. They wore sandals. They didn't have paved streets. With streets of dirt, which at times would become streets of mud. They didn't have indoor plumbing or sewer systems, so the streets could be lined with muck. They didn't have cars, so animals were used to move goods. And as the animals moved goods around, they deposited their yuck. And so through the mud and the muck and the yuck, Jesus walked walked with sandals covering his feet, not covering them much. And so here Mary comes to anoint the feet of Jesus. And she takes her hair, lets it down and scandalizes herself, and cleans his feet with the perfume in her hair. She takes down her hair and wipes his yucky feet. Can you imagine... How people snickered and made snide remarks about her behavior. How could she be so indecent? How could she do that? The nerve of that woman. Or of Jesus. He calls himself a rabbi, a teacher. Does he know what she's doing? How could he let this happen? Mary didn't allow their words or their thoughts to stop her from doing what she was doing. From surrendering what people think so she could show love to Jesus. She wasn't hindered by what people may say or what they may do. She let her hair down and wiped his 
feet. And the text says this was done to prepare him for his burial. It was a gift of love given by Mary to the Savior who would die for her. She was a follower of Jesus, a disciple of Jesus. And it seems like maybe when she was sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to his teaching, that she understood what none of the other disciples understood. That when he told them he was going to a cross to die, he actually meant it. And that was truly the plan. While the rest uh, were thinking of violent revolution, she understood the Savior came to die. And so she anoints him in preparation for what's going to happen soon. That he's going to go give his life for all of us. For her, for you, and for me. All of us. So she anointed him. How often do we let what people think hinder us from doing what God calls us to do? Maybe God's been calling you to do something for a while. Maybe it's been days, maybe weeks, maybe months, maybe even years. And you keep getting this prompting to the Holy Spirit where you feel like God's saying, go do this. And you keep saying, no, and you have excuses. What will they think? What will they say? What will I do? What will I say? And you keep putting it off, putting it off, putting it off. And yet God's calling you to go do something. Maybe he's been pressing into you to go tell a neighbor about his great love for them. And your excuse now is, well, social distancing, and I, I can't get too close, but you can still be close enough, six feet away, and tell your neighbor about God's love. Maybe he's been telling you to call someone, that God's placed someone on your heart that he wants you to reach out to, that you can call for them and pray for them for what's going on in their life. But what they think, or what they may think, keeps you from acting. Maybe he's been telling you to share, your, share our online church service with your Facebook friends. To just share our link and say, hey, I would, I would love it if, if you would come join us on Sunday on Facebook or on YouTube as we worship God together. Man, I'd love to see you join our service this week. You could share that with your friends, but you stop because what will they think or what will they say? We see that humility surrenders what people think. So again, that we can act in love. And the next thing we see is that humility surrenders what we want. Look at Matthew chapter 26, starting in verse 8. So when the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you'll not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Very truly, I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will always be told in memory of her. Matthew tells us that after Mary's amazing act of surrender and love for Jesus... The disciples respond by being indignant. Why this waste? Have you ever done something kind and loving for someone? And their response is, what a waste. Maybe you took time and energy to make something for someone and they say, what a waste. How crushing that can be. Yeah, that's how the disciples treat Mary. What a waste. Matthew tells us that their concern is for the poor. That this perfume could have uh, fed many hungry people. Yet in John's gospel, we get a bit more insight into what's happening. Look at John chapter 12, starting in verse 4. It says, But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended for that she would save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. 
John tells us that the instigator of indignation is Judas, who as keeper of the money bag wasn't motivated by compassion, but by self-interest, which Paul said for us that humility is not about self-interest. It's about looking out for others. And so Judas is consumed with how he can benefit. And so he sees Mary's amazing gift of surrender as a waste. Both the disciples and Judas are missing the point. Judas because of blatant sin. The others because of misguided motives. They didn't understand where Jesus was headed. That the disciples wanted to look and do good. And Judas wanted money for himself. That they were each unwilling to surrender to Jesus. All of them wanted something other than what Jesus wanted. Jesus wants them to understand where he is headed. That this act was to prepare him for the cross. It was a step on the path that would lead to our salvation. Have you ever heard the saying, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans? Maybe you've seen the meme on Facebook lately of um, 2015 and five years later. The thought of, you know, where will you be in five years? And, and no one expected that we would be in this situation five years ago. I think this idea is true as well. That if you want to make God laugh, tell him what you want. And that's not to say that God doesn't care about what we want. That God, the Bible tells us, is our good Father. That He loves us more than we know. And so as any parent, God does want to give His children what we want. But there are times where as the parent who knows more, who has more wisdom, who has a bigger view of things, we understand that sometimes when our kids tell us, they want something, that what's truly best for them is not to give them what they want. If our kids tell us, uh, you know, every time we're uh, someplace, uh, you know, out at a fair or a ball game, uh, you know, I, I want cotton candy. Okay, maybe cotton candy every once in a while is okay. But if you have a cotton candy every day, that's not a good thing. That sometimes we have to say no to what our kids want because we understand there's more going on that they don't get yet. Someday they will when they're parents. And so God, I think at times, when we, we, we want something so bad, but what we want can get, get in the way of what God is trying to do. It keeps us from surrendering. And so humility calls us to surrender what we want so we can pursue what God desires. And in doing so, we can then act in love. Last week we sang... David Crowder's song, Let Me Feel You Shine. And it says, since I, and the line in it is, I lift the knife to the thing I love most, praying you'll come so that I can have both. But the idea being, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to surrender this thing, and I pray that I can have you and what I want, but the bigger thing that I desire is you, Jesus. That we need to surrender what we value, surrender what people may think, surrender oh, what we want so that we can live humble lives, and show God's love to others. See, servant leaders live in willing surrender. Mary had this, this alabaster jar, symbolizing all of her hopes and her dreams, her most treasured possession, her, her own personal wealth. And rather than let that get in the way of following Jesus, she breaks the jar pours it on the Savior as an act of surrender and sacrifice. That for us, God's calling us to embrace this posture being servant leaders, which means to take and break our own alabaster jar, which is our own life, what we value, what people think, what we want, and to, 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 to lay that at Jesus' feet, to pour it out before him as an offering, and say, God, I'm giving all that I am, all that I am is being given to you to be used in love and service for others. And can we come back to what Mark Moore said? Humility is not so much about how you feel about yourself. It has much more to do with how you treat others. Humility is knowing who we are. So we then can act in love to someone else. And we see in the life of Jesus, Christ did that. 
He did that by loving the least. And this is something that we can do. We've been doing throughout this pandemic, going and delivering bags of food through in 68 hours of hunger to help kids in town who need food. That we can partner with local agencies like the Sunshine Soup Kitchen and the food pantries in town, providing food for those pantries so that people can receive food. Jesus went out and he lived the surrendered life by recovering the lost. That's what we're called to do. And there are a couple ways we can do that. One is just to pray for one person every day that you can share God's love with. And the second is just to find opportunities to tell people about Jesus. The third is Jesus defended the defenseless. So in our lives, speak up for the hurting and the broken. And speak out to those in fear and in pain. If there are those around you who are afraid or hurting, pick up the phone, call, talk to them. Share God's truth and your presence through your voice so they could know of God's love. The fourth thing we see is Jesus included the outcast. Maybe there's people you know, either on Facebook or in your life, who are alone. Pick up the phone and call them. Write them a letter, send them a card. Go drive to their house, stay outside, and talk through a window so they can see you and they can feel that connection that they're not outcasts and not alone. That all of us are called to take our alabaster jar, to break it, lay it at the feet of Jesus, to pour out our lives before him in surrender so we can show his love to others. Servant leaders live in willing surrender. We're going to offer a time of response. Maybe you're someone who could use prayer. We'd love to pray for you. Just share in the comments how we can be praying for you right now. Maybe you're ready to take your life, to take the jar that is your life, and to break it and lay it in surrender to Jesus. Just type in the comments, I want to follow Jesus. We would love to connect you on how you can begin a journey of living your life to love others in the name and power of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your great love for us. We thank you that you've poured out yourself for us, that you call us to do the same, to to break and to pour out before you the jar that is our lives so that you can use us to share your love with someone else. Father, empower us to live in willing surrender as we seek to love one more. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
This morning we heard from Pastor Dave about the characteristic of humility that is a part of being a servant leader. This characteristic was fully demonstrated by Christ during his time here on earth, and especially in the act of his sacrifice on the cross, which we're celebrating during this time of communion. If you have your elements, to, we encourage you to gather them together this time as we participate together. Let's pray. Father God, thank you. Father, thank you for the sacrifice that your son made, this true act of humility, of being on that cross and taking the sin of the world upon himself, to allow us to be forgiven and to be reconciled with his Father. Thank you, Father, for this time of worship we get to celebrate and remember. We ask in your name. Amen. The bread represents Christ's body broken for you. Take, eat, and remember this day. In the same way, our drink represents Christ's blood spilt for the forgiveness of our sins. Take, drink, and remember this day. Each week, we have an opportunity to respond to God's amazing love through giving. Here at Londonderry Christian Church, we seek to give as we receive. If you are currently out of work or working less because of the coronavirus pandemic, don't feel obligated to give if you aren't being paid or don't feel obligated to give at your previous level if you're working less. Also, if you're experiencing financial difficulty during this time, please email the church office and we will provide any help we can. If you're able to continue giving, thank you. Your giving allows us to love one more and help those in our church and community who are experiencing financial hardship. There are a variety of ways you can give. You can send a check to 372 Mammoth Road, Londonderry, New Hampshire, 03053. You can set up online bill pay through your bank, or you can give at LondonderryChristianChurch.com backslash give through PayPal. God bless. As we close, I want to say thank you for joining us today. A few reminders, if you'd like to connect with our church, you should fill out the online connect card that's pinned in the comments. There are also some things happening this week we want to let you know about. The first one is tomorrow night at 8 p.m. here on Facebook. You can join us for our Monday night prayer. So if there's something you'd like to have prayed for, if you'd like to join us uh, in prayer together, um, please join us tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Then also coming up on Friday night at 8 p.m. Eastern uh, is uh, Friday Night Devo. So I'm going to share a devotional thought intended to encourage you and help you in your faith uh, for the weekend and then the week ahead as well. So please join us for that. Also, if you would like to uh, follow Jesus and begin a journey of living uh, as a follower of Christ, or if you want to be baptized, you can type in the comments, I want to follow Jesus. And we will have one of our staff connect with you and begin to help you figure out and find ways you can start your journey and how you can be baptized into Christ. Uh, so again, thank you for joining us today as we've learned how to live in the posture of a servant leader who lives in willing surrender. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you've set the example for us of what willing surrender looks like by dying for us on the cross. May our lives of surrender be a pleasant aroma poured out in sacrifice to you. Help us to live in willing surrender as we continue to find ways to love one more. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Have a great week and keep finding ways to love one more.